the three images behind me were taken by the same person standing in the same room with the same camera from the same place. Yet they all look significantly different and make the room in question look significantly different. The one at the top right, um, the one at the top right is most representative of what a human would see standing in the same place, while the other two have been distorted using computer vision techniques in order to make them look bigger. This is a common problem in subletting and real estate on the internet. People exaggerate image room, images in order to make rooms look bigger than they actually are and look better than they actually are to fool potential tenants. So, good morning everyone. My name is Tanay, and I'm here along with Boris, Grace, and Joe to talk to you about our project, Scoring Geometric Distortions and Images. I'm going to walk you through the use case and motivation. Joe and Grace are going to go through some of the technical details, and Boris is going to wrap up with the results and some future work. So what motivated our project was last summer when all four of us were trying to find a place to sublet in New York. We looked at a bunch of places on websites like Airbnb and Craigslist. They looked pretty great. And then we went up to New York and we found them to be much damper, darker, and smaller than they actually looked on the internet. <laughs> we felt gypped by this and uh, we wanted to do something to correct it. So we worked with our advisor in order to figure out the four most common kinds of distortion in real estate images. The first is something called radial distortion, which creates a fisheye effect in the center of the image. The second is using an, uh, a lens with a low focal length in order to capture more of the image than you can normally capture. The third is taking the uh, image from a low vantage point in order to make the corner look larger. And the fourth is using Photoshop or some other software in order to programmatically stitch these images together and create a panoramic shot. Now, this problem is more pervasive than we originally thought it to be, and it uh, applies to almost all two-sided markets. There are tons of two-sided markets springing up daily on cars, on houses, on planes, on everything you can imagine. And the biggest impediment to the growth of these markets is trust. Think of an eBay without PayPal or an Amazon without a review, review system. It doesn't work that well. And this economy is booming, and without a solution to this problem, none of these startups are going to be able to flourish. When we look specifically at two-sided markets, we find that the research supports this result, too. All research in economics says that without trust between buyers and sellers, transactions are not going to occur, and the information asymmetry is going to prevent the market from actually taking off. Now, within real estate specifically, we looked at the solutions that currently exist. We found that Airbnb has ratings of people rather than the actual picture or the actual uh, physical apartment. We found that Craigslist has no verification whatsoever, which is why they can't monetize their site. And we found that Trulia requires both the buyer and the seller to trust a third party realtor who may be more interested in optimizing their own fees than actually representing the place well. So we thought about what an ideal solution would look like and looked at some solutions that are already out there. Most of them are uh, heavyweight, very technical, and very expensive. So currently, the user flow looks something like this. A user spends a lot of time looking at hundreds of images on Trulia or their favorite website. Then they're faced with three choices. Either A, they can buy it on trust. B, they can trust a realtor to look at it for them and hopefully accurately report what the place looks like. Or third, they can try and use one of these existing solutions, download it, pay a lot of money for it, and then get all this technical output that doesn't make much sense. All three of these have the potential to result in an unhappy user. So in a true hassle mapping sense, we decided to take all of that out and design a tool that is a Chrome extension that will be close to the point of sale, easy to use, and uh, intelligible for the normal user. Now Grace is going to demo that for you. Thanks, Tanae. So now we'll look at a demo of how our tool can help alleviate the problem of buyer-seller trust. Let's say you're uh, on Airbnb, a popular site for short-term rentals, and you want to determine if a particular listing's images are distorted. So you open up our browser extension and click the Get Score button, which launches the image analysis on our server and will return a result. <laughs> this result, uh, which you'll see in a few seconds, is broken down into three components, radial distortion, focal length, and field of view. In addition to those three components, you'll also get an overall distortion score ranging from 0 to 10. In this case, it's 6.6. .6. Uh, Zero on this range means that the image is not distorted, and uh, 10 means it's very highly distorted. So next, let's talk about the implementation. What components went into the building of this tool? The first step was feature detection, both of curved edges and straight edges. Curved edges formed the input for the radial distortion component, while straight edges were used to compute the vanishing points of the image. And finally, we uh, created a logistic reg regression model on the radial distortion component, on the focal length, and on the field of view in order to generate an overall distortion score for each image. So let's jump into the first component, <coughs> radial distortion. 
radial distortion is basically a distortion that's radially symmetric around a point in the image. And um, uh, to illustrate that, we'll look at an example. On the left, we have the original image, and on the right, we've used some <coughs> to add uh, some extent of radial distortion. You can see that the straight lines that were originally, or the lines that were originally straight are now somewhat curved around the edges of the image, and this is a common effect of wide-angle lenses, which in addition to having a low focal length will exhibit radial distortion around the edges of the image. Um, and uh, as you can see, curved lines are uh, an integral part of radial distortion, so in order to detect this type of distortion, we fit circles to the image. All right, the next component of our analysis involves the use of straight edges, and we use an existing edge detection uh, library called line, detect line Segment Detector, or LSD, to create the initial set of straight edges. From this set, we sampled, um, we randomly sampled 500 pairs of edges. Each edge pair creates an intersection point, which forms the vanishing point hypothesis. And we further reduce this initial set of 500 vanishing points via a voting and merging algorithm to arrive at a final set of about 50 vanishing point hypotheses. So next, Joe will talk about how we got from these 50 hypotheses to calculating the focal length of the image. Right. Thank you, Grace. So Grace talked about how we can take these lines and create sets of uh, clusters which <coughs> correspond to certain vanishing point hypotheses. Once we have these hypotheses, what we can do is we want to tr uh, find the three most orthogonal uh, vanishing points, or which informs us on the, the dimensions in 3D space. And as you can see, we pick the, the set of three edges, uh, sets of three edges, where they correspond to right angles to each other. Um, this helps inform us on the, on the vanishing points within the image. If you go back to elementary school art class, we can represent three dimensions on a two-dimensional plane by defining a couple of matching points and uh, making things that are further away appear smaller by uh, scaling them based on where they are relative to the vanishing points. <coughs> All images that are of three dimensions have three vanishing points. It just so happens sometimes these vanishing points are located at an infinite distance away from the image. So in the second example, what we can see is that one of the vanishing points is located, the vertical vanishing point is located at an infinite distance away from the image. And what this tells us about the image is that the image was taken uh, with no angle relative to the horizontal plane. And the third example shows us that the image has been taken from a high angle or a low angle. So this helps inform us on the distortions in the image. Once we have the vanishing points, we can calculate the focal length of the image as well. Using a bit of uh, trigonometry, we can figure out the uh, centroid of the three vanishing points, which tells us the image center or the principal point of the image. And that can help us calculate the focal, point, uh, focal length of the, of the picture. With the, armed with the focal length, we can also calculate the field of view, which is closely related to the focal length. And this is based on uh, another trigonometric property uh, so the diagonal of the image forms the base of the triangle, and the focal length, uh, focal length is the height of the triangle. And we can calculate how much of the uh, view has been captured by the lens. And as you can see, we have a low focal length lens capturing a much wider field of view, and a higher focal length lens capturing a much smaller field of view. Now that we know, uh, now that we have these two uh, types of distortions, uh, an understanding of those, we want to classify the three images we saw earlier. Of course, we want to classify the image that is original and most representative of what you would see in, uh, at the room personally as having low distortion, no distortion. Next, with a little bit of subtle distortions, we want to classify these images as having medium distortion. Uh, it's really hard to tell the difference between these two images but maybe subconsciously, you would find the one on the right to be a little bit bigger than the original image. Finally, we want to classify the last image taken with the low focal length, length lens <coughs> as having high distortion. <coughs> and Boris will talk about the results of how we classify these images. Right. 
So now that we've done all this analysis and we have kind of this data for what is the gradual distortion coefficient of an image and our estimates for the field of view and focal length, we thought it was really important to take all this data and turn it into something that's really easily understandable and tells you, you know, how distorted is an image. If I'm a user and I get all this data, it's kind of hard for me to just intuitively guess what it really means. So what we did is we came up with a predictive model that'll give you a score from zero to 10, telling you how distorted the image is. Zero being not distorted at all, 10 being very badly distorted. And the way we came up with this image is that we took it with this model is that we took a test set of 57 images and we first manually bucketed them into having either no distortion, a medium amount of distortion, or a high amount of distortion. We then ran the analysis that Joe and Grace talked about and we got our radial distortion coefficient and our estimates for our field of view and focal length. We then took both of these scores and we ran a multinomial logistic regression to train our predictive model. And the way this predictive model works is when we have a new image, we're going to run our analysis on it, and we're going to come up with our values. We then run it through the model, which will give us three probabilities. The probability that this image is not distorted, the probability that it has a medium amount of distortion, and the probability that it has a high amount of distortion. We then take these three probabilities and come up with this final probability weighted score, 0 to 10, telling you how distorted an image is. And with a little bit more implementation, we can then take this score, feed it back to our test set, and iteratively train our model. And so we took this analysis and this scoring technique and we packaged it into a client-server model with our Chrome extension on the client side. You saw this in our demo and uh, you saw this in our demo and kind of the reasoning behind why we chose this implementation is threefold. We thought that it was really easy to install by the user. Chrome extensions are easily accessible, easily installable, and you don't need to install additional packages or libraries to run the actual analysis. It also gives us really easy access to the images on a website, which then makes it easily available at the point of sale. So as you saw in the demo, you're looking for a room, you're browsing, you're wondering, you know, is this an accurate representation of the photo? You just open the Chrome extension, which then sends the image to our server where the analysis is done before it returns a score and is available for the user without ever leaving the web page of the original room they're on. And to give you an idea of how well this works, from a time perspective, it takes on average about 33, 34 seconds for the analysis to run. This is something that we could optimize with a bit of work, but we saw this project as a bit more of a proof of concept rather than optimization exercise. In terms of correctness, you see that our predictive model has a higher weighting for radial distortion than focal length. And you know, this makes sense both intuitively and from our manual, uh, manual scores. If you think about an image that has like really bad radial distortion, but all the lines are going to look very curved, the image itself is going to be a bit circular, and it's going to look uh, pretty different than what a room actually looks like with with straight lines. And you know, like all projects, ours is a work in progress, and so we see three main ways that we can improve it moving forward. The first of which is improving the scoring of the image, which I mentioned briefly we can do by taking the score that we get from our model and feeding it back into our test set to iteratively train our model. The second, uh, the second way we can improve our project is that we can try to actually correct some of the distortion we see rather than just scoring it. The third way we can do, the third thing we can do is optimize our tool, like I mentioned, to make that 34 seconds run a bit faster. Um, so thank you guys so much, and please let us know if you have any questions. Yes. So who do you view you as find this? Um, so I think we view our ideal customer as anyone who's currently using these sites to sublet or rent a place, um, which is usually you know people who are going somewhere for a short-term posting, a six-month or three-month job or internship. And also, if you look at the potential this has in terms of real houses and stuff like that, I think it's a good way for people who are looking at maybe thousands of houses to cut it down to hundreds before having to see that. I guess, um, um, how would you sell it? I mean, you're going to put this on Amazon.com and... Uh... Oh, so um, we actually see this being distributed through the Chrome extension store, which is accessible and has millions of extension for people, extensions for people, and I don't think we see ourselves as selling it necessarily until it has been validated and verified by multiple people. But then there's the option to sell it just through the Google store. Yeah? What about IE and other browsers that are built in a bit more popular than Chrome? Um, so, the first thing we would say is that just based on kind of qualitative research that we've done with 
what we see as our target customer. Chrome is more popular with the people that we want to use the product. And the second thing is given kind of the platform that Chrome has for these extensions and the easy access store, we figured that was the best place to start just for ease of use and technical implementation. But we do agree that there's some market out there in Internet Explorer and Firefox and other things. It's also easy to create a standalone web app that would plug into the libraries we've written uh, for the image analysis. So that would be accessible from any browser. <coughs> Thank you very much.